there you go, ladies and gentlemen. You should be posing right about here. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, not only one of the most brilliant orators in America and scholars, uh, Dr. Wilfred Riley is a tremendous author, a great statesman, and he also, during that particular segment, got some nice dance steps. I enjoyed watching him do his dance. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I want to introduce to some present to others, Dr. Wilfred Riley. Good evening, sir. It's a great pleasure to have you back with us. Uh, good evening. Thanks for having me back on the show. Listen, first and foremost, I am most jealous of the fact that you're able to grow your beard like that. I can't, no matter what, get my beard to grow that way. That's amazing. Uh, am I being hyperbolic here? Uh, it's an entertainment world. Football's entertainment. Does it have the power to create a black America and a white America separate and apart from one another? Well, I don't, I don't think so, really. But, I mean, there, there's a lot going on with this NFL uh, black national anthem thing. I mean, first of all, the, the easy kind of throwaway line that I've done once or twice on TV is I didn't know we had two national anthems. <laughs> but, uh, in fact... <laughs> Obviously, I mean, there, there are those great songs, Lift Every Voice and Sing, that have been associated with the black community, with black identity. I love that line, uh, serve my God and my native land. Yeah. But um, in general, let, let me gather my thoughts here. In general, I'm an opponent of corporate wokeness. Yes. Um, I don't really see a reason to play two national anthems for different races at something like a major sporting event. And yeah, I think the only possible impact of that will be more division. Um, I think people, our white countrymen, would stand up and honor that beautiful song if it was played once on um, you know, a holiday associated with, say, the death of Martin Luther King or something like that, or a yeah. Juneteenth Summer League game. I think if every game you're playing different ceremonial songs for every race, uh, I've now heard Hispanic friends say that they want something as well. Um, and obviously there are a lot of great wow. Latino kind of party starting songs you'd play. But I think by that point, when you get into, uh, you you did this, you were very diplomatic at the start of the show. You did about 15 minutes of the Pledge of Allegiance. Here's the black one, here's the white one. I think if you do that before every damn football game, I mean, a lot of people are basically gonna stand up only for their racist song. Thank and you. And you're gonna have a lot of off, yeah. And you're going to have a lot of awkward situations. I mean, what happens when the white quarterback has a knee bruise and sits down for the black national anthem? Or what happens when the black players kneel for the actual anthem, but then stand up suddenly recovered for the quote-unquote Negro national anthem, the black national anthem? So I think that this is going to increase the amount of polarization by probably a factor of two or three. Um... If you want to make that statement, play the black song once, have everybody clap, and then go back to what you're doing. Or if you're that cowardly, don't play an anthem at all. You don't yes. need to play ten. I mean, play a play a one bar Sousa march, and that's it. I think that might be how I'd solve it. Exactly. Now, I, it, into the the rest respect of the NFL at this particular point, since they're so woke, Godell is so woke, uh, and you have all of this emphasis on getting back. Uh, to bringing equality into the NFL. I want to ask you, if a white quarterback took a knee during the Black <laughs> National Anthem because, and then said after the football game, I took the knee because I want to end black-on-black -black crime, what yep, would be yep. the reaction Uh uh, well, I mean, the press? I, yeah. I mean, I think the reaction would just be a stupid media frenzy. Like, the other day I did uh, the Laura Ingram show, and we were talking yeah. about the black militia in Stone Mountain. And she asked what I thought the media would have done if that had been a white lockdown protest-style militia with the same guns being equally intimidating. And I think my honest response was just, well, there'd probably be twice as much coverage. We all know what the biases are. But it would be the same silly thing. I mean, it would be a couple-day media frenzy. Uh, in general, someone like a starting quarterback is going to have a contract that requires him to be paid $20, $30 million if you cut him. So what would actually happen is that people would go ham on Twitter for a week and then nothing. But, I mean, yeah, there, you're, there'd be more reaction to the white guy than to the black guys doing something equally irrelevant. Still nothing significant would happen to the white guy, but he'd probably have to apologize. 
Oh, one thing that would happen to the white guy that would prevent a white QB from doing that is endorsement losses. Ah. Um, I mean, even if you if, if you look at major Fox programs like Tucker Carlson that just dominate late night news, all the ads are for like my pillow. And I'm not mocking Fox. I mean, a partner that's brought me on a bunch of times. Obviously, no formal deal there. But I mean, yeah. like my pillow or Bible readings or something like that. I mean, it's it, there's definitely an issue in that conservative space already. So if you were, let's say, Troy Aikman back in the day, knelt down and was like, you know, my first serious girlfriend was black. I'm tired of this carnage in black communities. I mean, I don't think he'd be working for Nike anymore. <laughs> I mean, I don't think they'd have a line of cleats for him anymore. So I think in reality, it's very unlikely anyone's going to do that. Not to mention, I mean, a popular quarterback wouldn't be ostracized by his teammates, but there'd be at least one game where the O-line just didn't try that hard for a while. Like, there'd exactly. be a lot of messages sent like, hey, shut up about black-on-black -black crime, you're making us look bad. So the long form is it would be a louder, much worse version of the reaction to black athletes doing this stuff. It would go on longer. The one difference with white guys is that activists will try to attribute stuff like that to the entire white community, sort of, this is oppression, this is an example of privilege, look what we deal with every day. So there'd be a lot of noise made about it. What practically would happen, I don't know, but I don't think that that's very likely because of the endorsement issues and so on. Um, and you can make this point across the board. I mean, I remember, I just read Tim Tebow's book. You know, I had some spare time. I was, you know, an athlete for a while. I don't dislike Tebow, I have some admiration for the guy. Yeah. So I saw his book in the thrift store for a buck seventy-five. Bought it, read it, and uh, Tebow. Remember when he was kneeling because he was a Christian? Yeah, he was making these points like there, there are a lot of babies or fetuses, babies. If you're talking about third trimester, killed during abortion, I want that to stop. And the coverage of this was unremittingly negative. People on social media were fairly positive about it. But the, the mainstream media response was, look, you're a starting QB. The Broncos are barely going to make the playoffs. Why don't pay it, focus on the game plan? This isn't the place for politics. And I do think that we've seen a dramatic about face with regards to this when it came to people dealing down for woke reasons mm -hmm. and saying Black Lives Matter. And that's not atypical. I mean, if you look at, uh, I, I don't even remember the guy's name, but one of the starting uh, wingers for the Boston Bruins under Mr. Obama, President Obama, didn't go to the White House because he was a Tea Party guy. And he yeah. said, Barack Obama raised my taxes, bluntly, my personal taxes. I voted against him. I don't see why I would show up and pretend to be buddy-buddy with this guy. I'm going to go hunting or whatever instead. He was pilloried in the media. This went on for weeks. Yes. Under President Trump, People did exactly the same thing in greater numbers. I mean, you had entire squads, like women's soccer refused to go. The and the response Warriors. was, oh, this is, yeah, the, yeah, Golden State, Steph Curry and uh, the three-point shooting guys, yeah. I mean, but yeah. the response is, oh, these are brave people standing up for a real cause. So obviously you will see differences in how this is treated. Last line for me, because I'm a long talker, but we even hey. saw this with COVID-19, right? Yeah, I mean, like the lockdown protest, which are people objecting to their small businesses being shuttered and often having to close, those were described constantly as people killing grandma, spreading the germ. Then you saw the George Floyd protests and riots, where you literally had left and right fighting in the street with bats. You know, 20 million people went to just the peaceful protests. And all of a sudden, I mean, you had epidemiologists releasing statements saying, well, this isn't like other protests. The cause here is so important, this must be allowed. So short answer, I think there'd be a dramatic difference in how uh, protest during the two national anthems was covered. Long form, that's nothing new. We see biases based on conservatism versus liberalism, region, so on, urban, rural, all the time in the media. Dr. Riley, this too shall pass. Uh, I believe five weeks ago, when we were having the protests in the riots, people thought this was the end. We're about to break off and get into a serious um, imbalance in our country. All of a sudden, corporate America is woke and they're writing checks left and right to say that I'm not a racist. Will this pass? And will the effort in terms of the NFL be seen as nothing more than public relations theater. Well, it is nothing more than public relations theater. I mean, if you look at some of these companies, it, 
obviously they understand that they want to be viewed as brands for young, hip, urban, multicolored people and interracial relationships with skateboards and Mountain Dew in their hands. I mean, we all know the demographic of a lot of these advertising brands. So that you'll, you'll see people write a check to Black Lives Matter or something like that. And that's their decision as a corporate entity. But I mean, like Nike, for example, actually has slaves. I mean, Nike is yes! a company that has been accused over and over and over again to the point I'm comfortable saying this on the air on a pretty major show and no one's going to sue me, of running sweatshops in, where was it, Malaysia, Indonesia, China. Mexico, India, yeah, China, Vietnam. I mean, you know, that people made jokes about this on the late night air back when they used to be funny that just do it was what Nike overseers said in their warehouses. <laughs> you know, as someone pitch together their 1,000th gum sole of the day. I mean, the minimum labor age in some of these countries is like 10. So Nike is a company that's actually been, let's say, credibly accused of employing slave and indentured labor. They're writing checks uh, objecting to the racial climate in America today. I don't think they mean that. I don't yes. think the Chinese investors in Nike or the people at the very peak of a New York City brownstone really give a damn about race relations on the ground in LeBron James's hometown of Akron. Um, this is, of course, this is just corporate PR. Like the NFL is another classic example. I love football. I've never, you know, my high school sport for a bunch of reasons, mainly the team was bad when I was there. But I mean, it was, <laughs> let's be honest, no need for a lot of macho talk. We're grown men here. That's right. But I mean, but I've, I've always, Always been a big fan. Good buddies played. The local college teams were good. You know, this Northwestern's insurgency in Chicago in the 90s. And, I mean, the NFL is the extreme version of that sport. It's based around big men hitting each other. I mean, they found that 50% of their veterans, 54%, have serious head trauma. It's a warrior game. Um, and that that's the whole basis of it. And, honestly, for a lot of males and others, that's probably the appeal. So to see these guys out there before the game, before this gladiator contest with the plane shrieking overhead and the fireworks bursting in the sky like bombs, to see them make this statement, now we're all going to kneel for 30 seconds to celebrate black music, that's nothing but theater, that's nothing but performance, come on. It's, they're, not, they're not making everyone wear a pillow around their head. You know, it's, <laughs> that's not how it works. Of course this is just a statement of, we're showing support for this positive thing. Uh, you know, I don't even really have a problem with this. If, if something's basically positive, like blacks and whites not fighting, one, yeah. and you're a businessman and you want money too, and you yeah. say, okay, I'm gonna do a little song and dance here where we do, you know, the Asian American patriotic music for uh, two games, I don't even care that much. The issue that I will say as an investor is that I don't think a lot of these companies understand what their base is. Yes. I mentioned that everyone right now is chasing this base of like skateboarding, New York City kids and interracial relationships, you know, the urban edgy demo. I don't think that's the natural demo for a lot of brands. So like when Walmart says they're not going to sell any quote unquote Southern pride apparel, like no Confederate flags, but also nothing that says all lives matter on it. Um, exactly. Nothing with some of the Southern state flags. I don't really know. In fact, I'll say bluntly, I own Walmart stock. I think that's going to devalue it. I think there are probably more people that shop at Walmart that would buy an All Lives Matter shirt or the Mississippi flag. Nothing racist, but just those classic items. Then there are people that would be offended to see those items. I think you're going to lose money if none of that merchandise is available. Same thing with Dick's Sporting Goods. Dick's Sporting Goods quit selling guns. They don't sell firearms. They don't sell shotguns, rifles. This isn't just combat handguns. You know, the reason I would go to Dick's, unless I'm getting ready to go fishing, is exactly. to look at what's out there in terms of, you know, athletic and sporting equipment. Or, you know, is there a purdy shotgun here? If if my kid is going to play football, will this protect his head? What kind of ammunition do you guys have? It's a sporting goods store. 80% of their clientele is men. So to take the sporting goods out of the store because they could be used to hurt somebody People aren't going to go to your business. They're going to go to another business that still has firearms, that has ammunition, that has combat sports equipment. So I don't think a lot of these businesses have really thought about this. Like Dick's Sporting Goods got praised to high heavens on Twitter, but the stock's been stable ever since. I mean, yes. the goal shouldn't be being applauded on Twitter. And also Nike recently reporting $790 million loss uh, out of the last quarter uh, and having to... Re 
establish themselves in terms of laying people off and redoing their oh, yeah. merchandising decision. But speaking of merchandising decision, Nike decided to remove my favorite football team's merchandise. Okay? The Washington oh, yeah. Redskins. And I say Redskins with pride as a as a heritage of Native Americans. I'm not offended by the term Redskin. So I got to ask you here, is this again another PR, corporate PR, uh, for the NFL, knowing full well the Redskins moniker is the big money attraction to the team? $3.5 billion is not because they win football games. It's the, it's the brand. <laughs> Am I right? Yeah, I think so. Now, the, the Redskins is an interesting one because I actually try with that scientific training or that legal training to look at each case as a case. Um, mm -hmm. I generally, personally, I slant at least center right. I'm a kind of no-nonsense guy. So my natural reaction is get out of here with that BS, stop being woke, stop being PC. But Redskin actually is a racial insult. I mean, if you called a native guy a Redskin in the Dakotas, he might fight you. It's not like saying Indian or warrior so you understand, it's kind of puzzling that that logo has existed for such a long period of time with no pressure to change it. No, I mean, at one point I remember... No, there's been lots of pressure over the years. This has been going on since the 1960s. A constant ebb and flow of the left. And the left only wants to change this name so that they have the right to change every name in football. That's my opinion. Your thoughts. No, no, I mean, I, I think, and I was going to say, actually, I mean, I remember, like, Mary and Barry pre-crack, yes. you know, had some thoughts on the logo. You, you've heard some things, but this is a more of a blitz campaign. Uh, so I understand why people want to change it. My personal opinion is that they probably won't change it. If you look at that Redskins ownership team, I think that's still the Snyders over there. Yes. They have what in the sales and trading floor sector we used to call bleep you money. I mean, they can pretty much just say, no, we'll take a 5% hit and we'll keep selling the Redskins logo. The Redskins one, though, for me, is like Confederate statues where something actually is kind of offensive. So if the actual fan base is saying, look, enough with this, then I'm fine with them changing it. I wouldn't write letters or anything like that. Yeah. Um, I don't think that's what's happening, though. And there's a natural tendency for me to just backlash against woke stuff because once it starts, it generally doesn't stop. I mean, like the Confederate statue teardowns rapidly morphed into Washington and Jefferson and so on. So I basically, I understand the campaign against Redskin, but I think it'll stand. I, I don't think the ownership team will decide not to, to drop that. And it's worth noting, by the way, that most football teams aren't woke. They're all <laughs> named things like the Conquering Killers. I mean, like the Warriors, the Savages, the Buccaneers. I mean, the Buccaneers were rapist pirates. Those are the original Bukan makers down there in the Bahamas. The Raiders. So, I mean, like, if you actually... <laughs> the Raiders, that's another straight-up pirate logo. Like, they used to have a logo that showed a pirate carrying a woman. Yeah. Like, I mean, they have an eye patch pirate with a sword. I mean, so, like, it, you know, if you really wanted to get rid of non-woke teams, I mean, you'd have to start with the Fighting Irish, whose <laughs> logo is literally a drunken Irishman in a boxing pose. Okay. Then, you'd, I mean, you have to get rid of, what, the Vikings, the Buccaneers, the Pirates, the Raiders, and all of just the random things like the Conquistadors, the Aztecs. So my personal comment is that as a leader, that's not a thing I would focus energy on. Exactly. Same thing with the statue debate. Like, if I had, act if I had more than two actual Confederate statues in a city as a black leader, I'd probably call for some kind of referendum on them. And if the citizens black and white said keep them, then we'd keep them. Yeah, And I personally, I don't tend to feel as a businessman very oppressed by things in my life. I don't think most people that are kissing their girlfriend under a statue of the lone infantryman know who that guy is. Thank they you. don't know whether he's wearing blue or gray. They don't know what type of rifle he's holding. It's an infield, by the way. They, uh, there are a lot of kids that probably don't know which side won the Civil War if they're from the working class in the South. Exactly. So, I mean... I don't. I think that people try to make these things into issues as real issues vanish. What's something that would upset me as a successful black man racially? Someone calling me a racial insult. 
Yes. Uh, someone marching as part of the clan, or to a lesser but real extent, something like the Panthers, racist group on either side, racist militia, that would bother me. Yeah. Um, a hotel not refusing to, refusing to serve me after a long day of doing sales or something like that, that would bother me. Uh, I guess someone saying no to a date because they don't date any black men, that would bother me. Uh, the same no, thing would bother that's me. that's okay. That's okay. <laughs> it's uh, preferential. Like that... <laughs> that's a little racist. I mean, but anyway, like that, but that's what I'm saying. That one, that one's at the verb. Like, but that don't bother me. Like statues of people that once fought my ancestors. Exactly. Like it, it's the, the the weakness has moved from just the left into sort of these traditionally conservative white communities as well. Where now you have white guys that want to take down Crazy Horse because he apparently committed atrocities when he won battles. And it's like, enough with these dead generals. You know, the fight was 200 years ago. Don't you have problems in this community today? I mean, these poor white communities, suicide, opiates, and we know about our communities. So in general, I think this is all a waste of time. I understand referendum style votes on some things like red skin, but my impression would be that's probably not going anywhere. Exactly. Question for you. Wouldn't it be better for the woke people just to hand me their George Washingtons, their Thomas Jeffersons, okay. their Benjamin Franklins? Wouldn't it be better? And that way we could absolve ourselves of the in God we trust issue with them. Well, that's actually a point that some legitimate white radicals that I don't agree with, but I'm more than willing to talk to, like Tim Weiss, have made, <laughs> where they've said, like, look, you have to understand this is all performative. Like, if you really want to do something for POC citizens, give money. And as someone who's done work with groups, like, I mean, I've been a keynote speaker for the NAACP and talked about yeah. how can we in this community, I've never done anything national with them and racial campaigns or anything, but how can we in this community raise money to coach young black and, by the way, working class white men? Yeah. What can we do about a charter school? Like, I'm more than willing to do stuff like that. Love doing that. If you want to help people give money. So at the national level, though, what I'm saying is, it, Weiss would say, if you want to help the black community and you're a tenured professor, why not hire a black guy who's qualified as your research assistant, as opposed to a Caucasian legacy at the same college? Why not give up your job if you're really all that woke? Yeah. You know, why not give a qualified Asian American applicant or something your position? And nobody ever does this. Exactly. So yeah, it's, it's just silly performativity. Like when you look at the number of people that are dead in black communities, or I always will say also poor white communities, mm -hmm. and how much that would change if we renamed the Redskins the Tooth Fairies. I mean, that wouldn't change at all. Exactly. So I mean, if you want to do something for Native American Indians, why not go to the reservation and volunteer? You know, all this running around is with a feather in your hair as a white person, talking about you don't understand what an insult it is to have a team called the Glorious Warriors. It, total waste of time, in my opinion. Final question for you. Regarding today's meeting at the White House on opening the schools, is that a win? Is that a loss? Is that a draw? Does it even make a difference right now before Labor Day? Well, I mean, my feeling on COVID-19, we had a good conversation about this last time, just as yep. two you know, educated men, not doctors, but had read, I think, between us, almost every one of the studies. My prediction then, and I won't say hold you, but was that, and I don't think you disagreed with this. My prediction then was that if you looked at who took the first round of COVID-19 tests, we would find that the CFR and the IFR for COVID-19 were much lower than had originally been projected. And to some extent, that was obvious just from the absence of corpses in the street in countries like Sweden, Japan, I think you'd have to say India, that never really shut down in the first place. Yeah, I mean, certainly some regional lockdowns in India, but their cities look pretty busy to me if you go online or go on Google Earth. <laughs> so it turned out that was exactly the case. The uh, CDC, about a month back, released a final IFR estimate for COVID-19, this looks pretty definitive, of 0.26%. So that means if you get COVID-19, you have a one in 400 chance of death. And that's with elder seniors included in the sample. For anyone below my age, it would be infinitesimal. It would be even lower than that without pre-existing conditions. Of course, people in that position should be yeah. careful. So now that we're aware of that, I do think that a lot of the frenzy about COVID-19 was revealed to be badly sourced. It was revealed to be in some cases partisan. 
And I think we've seen that with the response to the George Floyd protests as versus the much smaller lockdown protests. I mean, quite frankly, you know, I still wear a mask in packed indoor areas, but I changed back to my normal routine. I'll say this openly on the air. When I saw people endorsing the George Floyd protests, I mean, (laughs) 20 million people can go out and dance in the streets using an upper end estimate for participation, but a very realistic one. Then I think it's just silly to say people can't go to church. I mean, there are hold a service outside. It's just silly to say that one is dangerous and the other's not. So I think in the context of what we're learning, opening the schools is probably a good idea. Yeah. And I will say, I, I thought I might get asked that question here and on some other places today. So I actually looked at uh, the American Association of Pediatrics, which is a very serious group of doctors, which is who I would consult on this. They endorse opening the schools. Yes. They say very bluntly, they say that almost no one who is under 35 has died from COVID-19. The total number of U35 deaths in the United States is 940 as of yesterday. Mm-hmm. They say that kids being at home puts them at risk for sexual abuse, physical abuse, domestic violence, all the stuff you get with a big family trapped in one building. Um, and the comment is that certainly, at least up to the college level, most or all these kids should be going back to school. Unless there's some kind of pre-existing health order for, say, one county that blocks that. And I agree with the docs on this one. I don't see any reason we shouldn't do that. The other thing with COVID-19 is that people don't seem to understand it's not going anywhere. Yes! Like, by this point, by this point, we've seen something, we're probably at around 10% infection for the country. Um, and, you know, this is, that's not herd immunity yet, but it's also at the point where, you know, people cough onto blankets and so on, where diseases become cyclical, where there's enough of, as they say, infected material that it's very likely the disease will be back next fall. There's no, and again, there are many countries that have beat COVID temporarily, but still have uninfected populations. There are countries like China, where we frankly know tens of millions have been infected. So there's no reason to think that when business travel starts again post-summer, we're not gonna see second waves and surges. So we can't, people can't just stay in their houses for 10 years. I really think that in 1957, 58, we saw a flu epidemic that was worse than this one. We saw 250,000 deaths as versus 130,000 from this. Uh, Smaller population. We saw that during a period of war and conflict. And I've asked friends that are in the history field, what did we do? And they basically said nothing. Masks were recommended. Uh, Large events were canceled. But the basic statement was, I mean, well, we just finished World War II where we lost half a million. Uh, Korea was either going on or on the horizon, killed 60,000. I mean, there are 3 million people a year that die of cancer and industrial accidents. So the comment was people were asked to wear a mask to be polite in public, and then life just went on. We didn't per se do anything. So I think with COVID-19, you saw kind of this newer, more safety conscious, softer culture interact with a similar viral epidemic, and that produced a major panic. But the idea of keeping the schools closed for nine months, no, I, I can't endorse that. It doesn't make any sense. Thank you very much, Dr. Riley. How can people get your book, sir? Well, my books are pretty widely available. I mean, obviously, the best resource is Amazon. Um, You you all know the website for that, Google Amazon. Uh, Both of my books, by the way, have been in the top few hundred for the past few days. So I'd really love it if Taboo or Hate Crime Hoax became a bestseller. Yeah. If you're interested in an individually signed copy, I mean, I see that my Twitter and my email have been up at different points during the show. Google Wilfred Riley or go to one of those, uh, those locuses and just message me. I have a box from the publisher I can send one over, but Amazon's great, local bookstores are great. And again, we're talking right now a top few hundred book in the country, so hopefully people will keep driving that forward. I hope so. And also send me one. And teach me how to get my beard like that, man. I, I like that. That's cool. <laughs> Dr. Riley. You gotta pick it out. <laughs> it's awesome having you here. We look forward to you coming back next month. Dr. Wilford Riley with us tonight, ladies and gentlemen. You have to get the book. It will soon become a bestseller. Taboo, 10 facts you can't talk about. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll be right back with more of the best in urban conservative talk. Yes, I'm your Shirley Kim McClinton, TECN TV president. We are a republic, not a democracy. We are as well the best in urban conservative news, talk, and movies. Coming up in the second hour, ladies and gentlemen, a conversation with Raynard Teddy Bear Jackson on Trump wanting to open the doors 
and the left wanting to close the doors to our educational system. We'll be right back right after these messages. Kick it! You know what to do. <laughs> <laughs> 